And what I'd like to do now is to have our Vice President of Programs, and actually the Executive VP is here, uh, Mr. Jerry Mungai, will introduce our speaker for this evening. Jerry. Can you hear me? Oh, good. I think you can. Good evening. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to share what I think is good news. Only 1,353 days left of the Obama <laughs> Deo gracias. Anyway, it's up to all of us now to use our time, talent, and treasure to ensure conservative election victories in 2014. And just the thought of Pelosi being speaker should be enough to unimpeached invigorate us to do that, and to gain the presidency in 2016 with candidates, not Republicans necessarily, candidates who will articulate the principles of freedom laid out in our founding documents. Here, here. Here, here. Looking out amongst the audience tonight, I think it's safe to say that Bill Widow really doesn't need an introduction. He's had quite a varied career. career. He's an author, writer, commentator, and comedian, I might add, who's had various positions within the audio and visual media. In 2009, he began making videos for PJ Video with his Afterburner and Firewall video series. His answer on an Afterburner episode to Hillary's, what difference does it make now? <laughs> question about uh, the congressional inquiry about what happened in Benghazi last year is a classic. I encourage you to see it if you haven't. Watched it already. And he gave a terrific talk in January at David Horowitz's Restoration Weekend in January when he explained how Republicans just don't really believe in their own message and how Romney should have answered a hypothetical question posed by an esteemed CNN reporter, Candy Crawley, on how someone worth $200 million can relate to average Americans. It's really beautiful. Bill has been a very busy guy working to educate us all about freedom and what we must do to spread the blessings of liberty. Tonight, he's going to speak about civilization and how it is in crisis. So now, please join me in welcoming Bill Whittle. told uh, originally when we booked this that uh, I'd be coming up to San Francisco to talk to some conservatives and I thought that'd be lovely. We'll get no breakfast, no two or three of us. <laughs> Cup of coffee, maybe a little Danish, chat about what's going on in the world. Maybe a third person might come by and we move out to the den. Uh, what a pleasant surprise. What a pleasant surprise to see this many patriots in, in a place uh, that gave us uh, Nancy Pelosi and, and so many other evils. You know, our, we uh, we should have this town back. We deserve to take San Francisco back. It's just a pretty world. It shouldn't be owned by these by these people that are out to destroy prosperity. You know, if they were, uh, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. <laughs> Shouldn't, you know, if, if the progressives had run San Francisco earlier, we'd have the Golden Gate recycling compost heap. <laughs> we deserve to have it back. Now, as far as this thing goes, I want to say, I know I'm speaking in an extremely liberal place because it's the only time I've ever been a conservative addressing other conservatives where they have the news waiting for me in advance. <laughs> this is for Ann Coulter and other very, very thin speakers who weigh about 70 pounds. I think I'll probably break that when the thing is over. And finally, I have my little phone here to, got a picture of Fidel Castro on the front to keep me out of four hour territory. So let's get started. Um, you know, I do want to be serious to begin here because I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I've been saying this since the election. I've spoken more since the election than I did in all the, all the years before the election, the 2012 election. And uh, I do want to say this because I mean this from the bottom of my heart. We, 
we all took one on the chin in November that uh, is just almost impossible to get back up from. I mean, that was just unbelievable. I was sure we were going to win that election. I knew we deserved to win the election. And I know that every single person in this room felt the same way I did when they called Ohio for this Marxist, traitorous son of a gun. And I know you felt the way that I did, and I know the fact that you had to go through months as I did, just trying to come to grips with the, with the enormity of the catastrophe. It's kind of like, it's really kind of like watching the Titanic hit the iceberg, and as it's going down by the bow, and people are screaming and dying, they throw the engines in reverse, back her up five or six miles, get up a full head of steam, and then hit the same iceberg again. <laughs> In all seriousness, in all seriousness, there's a number of things that good, good things that came out of that loss, uh, not the least of which is that it's forced us to really examine who we are, what we believe, and how to sell that message. I think if we won that election, we kind of just assumed it was a one-off fluke, and we just go stumbling off into the darkness, unable to explain to the American people who've never heard this message intentionally because of our education system what we really mean and what we're trying to say. So while I'm not happy about it, I think some good can come of it, and that's really what I want to concentrate on tonight. I don't have to tell you that this country's in crisis. We already know that. Uh, I want to talk to you about how we're going to get out of this crisis. That's the important thing. And it's all going to come down to the messaging. So before we start, I want to tell you, each and every one of you, on behalf of those of us that are honored enough to be in the spotlight about these ideas and these philosophies, that none of this country, this country wouldn't be here without you people coming to these events. You're the foot soldiers, you're the people that go out and work the precincts and you make the phone calls and you get the votes and I get to jet around and live this glamorous life. But honest to God, there would not be a United States of America if it weren't for you people. I can't tell you how proud I am to be on the same team as all of you. And I can't tell you how proud I am that you'd come out after a loss like this and get ready to go and fight these people again. Because conservatism, when you get right down to it, if you believe in what we believe in, you believe that the world runs down that standards fall and that things get harder and worse and, and we have to roll that boulder up that hill every day. That team gets to push the boulder downhill in the morning and we have to roll it uphill every night and every morning we wake up we have to push it up again and you gotta mow the grass every single week. There's no rest, there's no end. The only end is victory for them. We we'll never win. We can only just keep fighting. We just have to get up every day and do it. So I'd like to just tell you, for those of you who are thinking that maybe it's not worth the struggle anymore, and maybe you think it's time to pack up and move to Montana and stock up on beans and ammo, that, <laughs> that first of all, that's not a bad idea. And secondly, secondly, I'd like to remind you of a story that you all probably know that I know maybe a little bit better than some of you. My mom is a British subject to this day. And she was nine years old during the Blitz when the Battle of Britain happened, and she saw a fat little man in a one-piece jumpsuit wearing a funny hat, carrying his umbrella, standing on top of the rubble of what used to be a church, and shaking his fist as those German bombers flew back to France to load up and rearm and come back again, and holding up the V for victory. And if any of you know Britain really well, you know this isn't exactly the V for victory. <laughs> But what I'd like to say about Winston Churchill is, I'd like to say this. I'd like to say that every single one of you in this room tonight has a Winston Churchill in you. Because if you look at what happened to Great Britain when Winston Churchill became prime minister, he didn't get them into that trouble, you know. He became prime minister a day or two before France surrendered. And the entire continent of Europe had been overrun by the Germans. The Germans were at the heights of their power. And every single prior prime minister of Great Britain and every single advisor that Winston Churchill had said, make the best deal you can with Hitler now. He likes the British. You'll, Britain will become his favorite province. Make the best deal you can now. And Churchill said, never, never. We will never surrender this country to these people, never. We will fight them on the beaches, we will fight them on the waves, we will fight them in the skies, we'll fight them in the cities. We shall never surrender. Never. And that's a decision that one man made. And one man's individual decision turned into history. Because if any other man had been prime minister, we'd be speaking German now. I believe that absolutely. One man made a decision every single day to fight these people, and we won. And we have to make that same decision too every day. So don't give up. Don't let them get to you. We fought tougher things than these jugular narcissists. And <laughs> it's actually going to be pretty easy. So where are we right now? How do things look for us out there? Well, 
Every time I look out on the landscape today as a conservative, I'm reminded of another World War II quote. Uh, many of you may know that during the, uh, the winter of 1944, it looked like the war was pretty much over. It looks like we had it in the bag. A lot of people thought our boys would be home by Christmas. And it turns out that Adolf Hitler had been saving some of his very best troops in the West, and he pushed a bunch of uh, Nazi SS armor divisions through the Ardennes Forest, and some of his crack storm troops hit the American line where we were weakest with troops that would either completely bled out and exhausted or just frontline kind of clerks and cooks kind of thing. It was called the Battle of the Bulge. And Hitler overran the position so fast that one town that was occupied by the 101st Airborne and a lot of cooks and clerks was called Bastogne. And one day, one of the commanders of Bastogne at the height of the Battle of the Bulge went to the top of a church steeple. And he looked around with his binoculars and he could see in the woods and on the roads all around this tiny little town. He went all the way around the compass points with his binoculars and he looked out there and he turned to his adjutant, his assistant, he said, well, looks like they got us surrounded. The poor <laughs> bastards. <laughs> stepped on my best line, but at least I don't have to worry about being executed anymore. <laughs> They've got us completely surrounded, the poor bastards. That was his opinion. That was Creighton Abrams said that. I feel exactly the same way. They've got us completely surrounded, the poor bastards. They don't know what's going to hit them. Because we are facing forces now that are not just, the, not just elections, they're not just election forces, they're not just economic forces, gigantic tides of history that we've always been told are working against us, that the clock is running down for conservatives, that you're all just a bunch of dying dinosaurs and pretty soon it'll all be over. Well, turns out there are dinosaurs and soon it will be over for them, but it's not going to be us and I'm going to spend the rest of the night telling you why. But before we get into the details of this, I want to reiterate something that this gentleman just said a few moments ago. I want to talk about the nature of the crisis that we're facing right now. You know, I don't really worry about military threats to the United States. I know that's an odd thing to say, but I genuinely don't really worry about military threats to the United States. That's not that somebody couldn't hurt us or somebody couldn't hurt us very badly, very badly. But there is no force on the earth out there today that could change the American way of life. Not out there. This country was founded by defeating the most powerful military force on the face of the earth. This little group of colonists and farmers beat the machine of Great Britain's empire. It's the first thing we did. We fought the toughest armies on the planet, other Americans in the Civil War. We're still here. We beat the fanatical heroism of the Japanese, the technological genius of the Nazis. We beat those guys after a slow start. Destroyed them, utterly crippled them, then we helped them back up to their feet. We destroyed an ideology that imprisoned two-thirds of the world with a collectivist idea that has executed probably a hundred million innocent people killed in the name of communism, beat them too. And then the jihadis decided to take a try at it and we kicked them in the teeth. People wonder what happened to Al-Qaeda. Most of Al-Qaeda is dead and buried in the sands of Iraq. Our U.S. Marine Corps took care of Iraq and so did the Army and so did the Air Force and so did the Navy. I'm not worried about what happens from the outside. I'm worried about what happens from the inside. Because we're facing a crisis now that will change the way Americans live in a way that we cannot predict. And in order to demonstrate this, I want to show you something. These are props in the sense that they're practical objects, but these are not phonies. These are real deals. These are actual items that I have in my hand here. And this is a demonstration I like to make. I want to hold up two different colored pieces of paper. They're just rectangles of regular paper. They've got pictures on them and they've got numbers. Just two rectangular pieces of paper. Here they are. Just pictures with numbers on them. This one has a picture of uh, Andrew Jackson and it's a $20 bill drawn on the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States of America. And this one, for reasons that defy understanding, have a pile of rocks on the front. And it is actual legal tender, it's actual currency drawn on the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, and it is in the amount of $100 trillion. <laughs> now, I don't know about you guys, but I never leave the house without $100 trillion in the wallet. You never know when you may need to get snowed in in Denver, you may need to buy United Airlines, or maybe you need to buy Denver. Uh, but to be serious for a minute, a piece of paper with pictures and numbers on it for $100 trillion. And here's a paper with pictures and numbers for $20. And if you put these two rectangular pieces of paper on a table anywhere in the world and ask any person in the world to pick up one of these two things, they'll all of them, all of them will pick up this one because we still perceive that this one can buy something. You can still get something for this. This is worthless. This piece of paper isn't. But 
If they continue to borrow money at the rate they're borrowing and print money at the rate they're printing, the day will come when this becomes as worthless as this is. And when that day happens, we simply don't know what's going to happen. No one can predict it, no one. We think, well, we've been through a depression before, true, but when we went through the depression before, fully half of Americans, or nearly half, lived on farms, could grow their own food. Most of the people who, who lived through the first depression worked outdoors and knew how to work with their hands. You look at kids who are 20 years old today, I don't think, but a handful of them have never even been outdoors. <laughs> don't know what that world is going to look like. But I'll tell you one thing, if the American currency collapses, the world currency will collapse. And in this technological society with, with billions of people living in cities who no longer can grow their own food, it will be a catastrophe unlike anything we have ever seen in human history. And I say that only to say that we simply cannot let that happen. We cannot let it happen. And that means we have to win elections. We have to stop these people, and then we have to start reversing the damage that they've done. We just don't have any choice. Because moving to Montana with the beans and ammo will not help us. This whole thing could come down, and we can't let it happen, and we won't let it happen. I'm utterly convinced of that. So before we get started tonight, let me tell you what I think we've been doing wrong. Because if we understand what we've been doing wrong, I think it gives us a much clearer idea of what we've been doing right. And this would actually be a good moment for me to ruin my uh, future political career. Excuse me one second, please. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That was so worth it. That's so worth a Senate seat. Who needs to be president when you've got delicious arrowhead water? Okay, now that we've gotten the important stuff out of the way, here's what I think we've been doing wrong. I think the Republican Party, the GOP leadership, and the national level Republican politicians are making in real time, right in front of our eyes, what has been called the biggest mistake in American business history. I think they're doing the exact same thing as what was called the biggest mistake in American business history. So let me tell you about that giant business mistake that was made. Let's say that our vision of America as a fundamentally good place where people should be left alone, govern themselves, where the government is small, you should be able to keep most of your money, low taxes, low regulations, that place. Let's call that Coca-Cola. Let's call that political vision Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is the most popular brand in the world, and conservatism, as we understood it, is also the most popular brand in the world. Last time we ran a Coca-Cola president, he only got 49 states. That was Ronald Reagan in 1984. He came 5,000 votes short in Minnesota of getting 50 states. That's 50 out of their 57, Mr. Obama. That's a pretty high percentage. <laughs> the time we ran a Coca-Cola president before that, also Ronald Reagan in 1980. We only got, what, 45 states that time, I guess? And some people say that America's gone, doesn't exist anymore. But in 2010, we ran a Coca-Cola election. We ran to stop Obamacare. We had a Tea Party that was fired up. We had a mission. We had a cause. And we ran on pure conservative Coca-Cola. And we had, what was it, the second or biggest uh, upset in the history of the House of Representatives? Took the purse springs away from these Marxists that were going to spend every penny. They had me a little tougher for them not having the House. That was a Coca-Cola election. It was won by, by selling Coca-Cola. And if you think about it, if you think about conservatism as Coca-Cola, every single thing that this country did in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, right up into the 70s, everything we did as a culture basically was an ad for Coca-Cola. It was an ad for the kind of life that we believe in. I'll give you an example. Take a movie that doesn't seem like a political movie at all. Let's take It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life is an ad for Coca-Cola. It's an ad for conservative America. Why? Because It's a Wonderful Life talks about Bedford Falls. Bedford Falls is America. And in the vision of Coca-Cola, that Coca-Cola vision of It's a Wonderful Life, America is a fundamentally good place. Not like today's movie where America is fundamentally a bad place. America's fundamentally good place. Bedford Falls is a good place. And Bedford Falls is a good place because there are good people in it. And the entire story of It's a Wonderful Life is what happens to society when you pull a man's virtue out. What happens to America, to Bedford Falls, when you take a good man and his virtue out? Becomes Potterville, becomes a horror, becomes a nightmare. The soda, the, the drugstore turns into a strip joint. 
And when the goodness, the natural innate goodness of the American man and woman, in this case the American man played by Jimmy Stewart, when the natural innate goodness of that man is returned to this nightmare world, which is out of balance, it becomes Bedford Falls again, and Jimmy Stewart realizes it's not about money and it's not about achievement, it's about character, and he's the richest man in Bedford Falls. Now that's an ad for Coca-Cola, that's an ad for the America we believe in. Now, to the point. Starting in the 60s, progressives started to challenge this conservative idea of America. And right around that time, Pepsi started to make an aggressive effort towards Coca-Cola's dominance. Now, by the time we got into the mid-80s, Pepsi's market share was growing and growing and growing. So apologies to you Pepsi drinkers out there, but let's call the progressive vision of America Pepsi. So, as Coke watched progress, as Coca-Cola watched Pepsi's market share grow and grow and grow, Coke had far more resources than Pepsi did, but Pepsi was very, very smart. Pepsi said, we don't have anything like the kind of money that Coca-Cola has, so how are we going to spend our advertising dollars? Are we just going to spread it out over everybody? No, if we do that, it'll get lost. Pepsi said, since we have a small advertising budget, we're going to spend it all in one place, and Pepsi-Cola is going to advertise to young people. Brilliant, brilliant, young people. It's the, it's the taste of a new generation. What's brilliant about that idea is, if kids start growing up drinking Pepsi, when they get married, they're going to marry other Pepsi drinkers. And when they go out and buy Coca Cola, when they go out to buy cola for the family, they're going to buy Pepsi. And pretty soon the whole country will be will be drinking Pepsi because the kids started drinking it. And that's exactly what the GOP is doing. The GOP is looking at this progressive market share. They're looking at all of this liberalism that's going on. And then they're about to make the same mistake that Coca-Cola made in the mid-1980s. It was the biggest mistake in American corporate history. It was called the single stupidest move in all of business. Coca-Cola took the best brand in the world, the number one drink in the world, a label that has been the same since 1886, a distinctive Coke bottle shape, and they threw it all away and said, I know what we're going to do. We're going to get rid of Coca-Cola, and we're going to make a drink that tastes more like Pepsi, and we're going to call it New Coke, and everybody will love it because it look at all the people that are drinking Pepsi. New Coke was a catastrophe, and that's exactly what they're doing to us politically. They're taking away real conservatism. They're not even offering that for sale anymore, and they're making this hybrid sort of a philosophy that looks and tastes a lot more like liberalism, and they're wondering why nobody drinks it. Who wants it? Who wants the new Coke of politics? Who wants conservatism that is so watered down that it's virtually liberalism? Who really wants to come out and vote if the choices are the guy who invented Obamacare and the guy who implemented Obamacare? It's new Coke, and nobody wants it. The Coca-Cola drinkers don't want it because they like Coca-Cola. The Pepsi drinkers don't like it because they like Pepsi. If we want to win elections, we cannot continue to take this party towards the moderates. The way you win elections is to turn moderates into conservatives. That's how you win elections. And how hard is it, honestly? How hard is it to do? It's really not hard at all. I'm going to come back to how easy it is to sell this vision of conservatism to the American public in a minute. But before I do, I want to talk about these giant historical forces I told you about that are on our side, that are working in our favor. Now, you're going to have to excuse me for about four or five minutes here. I've got to give you a little bit of a history lecture for all this stuff to make sense. But if you look into history, all the way back into human history, you find out that really, really, when you get right down to brass tacks, only three things have ever really happened. There's been any number of wars and hundreds and hundreds of nations and scores of empires and diseases and all kinds of catastrophes and famines and plagues. It's only been three things that really changed everything. Now, the first of these things that really changed the world happened about 7,000 years ago in Sumeria. It's called uh, between uh, Mesopotamia, means between the rivers. That's between the Tigris and Euphrates. Interesting enough, that's in modern day Iraq. And back there between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, about 7,000 years ago, people figured out that if you planted a certain kind of grass, that that grass would grow in such abundance that if you used the seeds of that grass, you could make bread. And one person now, for the first time in human history, could feed more than himself. He could feed tens, if not hundreds of people, one man. And they called this man a farmer. 
The fact that a farmer can feed more people than himself starts civilization because prior to agriculture, every single one of you had to get up every single day and go out there and hunt for the, for the food or gather the berries you needed to get through that night and maybe through the winter. But agriculture meant that one person could grow enough food for a lot of people and that meant that you could have cities that didn't move around and it also meant that if one guy's growing the food for other guys, that means those other guys can become doctors and musicians and philosophers and priests and politicians and even lawyers. So it's not a total plus, but as a general rule, it was good for humanity. So the invention of agriculture was the first big invention in human history. And if you think about this document that we revere so much, if you think about this constitution, and you think about the society that produced this constitution, this constitution is the result of an agricultural society. This is an agrarian document for an agrarian society. Its definition of what the federal government should be is actually pretty simple. Build us a navy to keep the British away. Build us an army to keep the Indians and those warlike Canadians off our backs. And maybe, we'll have a discussion about this, maybe pave the road from my farm to the market so that I can get my goods to market and otherwise leave us alone. Leave us alone. Because an agrarian society is very independent, it's very proud, it's concerned with its borders, it's self-sufficient, self-reliant. All of these qualities that we like mean a small federal government that just does very, very few things. It's a result of first wave agricultural thinking. Now, 7,000 years ago, agriculture was invented. And about 300 years ago, the second big thing that happened to people occurred. And that was called the Industrial Revolution. And that wasn't a big committee of governors and, and politicians in Washington that sit down behind a table somewhere and say, you know what we need? We need steam engines. Didn't work that way, Mr. President. They actually did build it. Actual individuals went out there and started tinkering and playing around with steam power and later internal combustion engines with gasoline. And they began to realize that there was enormous energy available to make things. Now, the richest American in the world might have come to an event like this 200 years ago in a carriage drawn by four horses. I go everywhere I go in a carriage drawn by 360 horses. And I'm nothing like the richest American, although I do have $100 trillion on me in case I need it. <laughs> the power of the Industrial Revolution changed the world. But this is the critical point you have to understand because this is the case I'm building here. The economy changed first. And then the government had to change to administer the new economy. So how did our federal government change when the Industrial Revolution happened? Well, the Industrial Revolution really kicked in right after the Civil War, right around the turn of the 1900s. And we start getting these constitutional amendments like prohibition. Alcoholism is a city problem. That's not a farm problem. We start worrying about social security. We start worrying about things like public transportation, public health. These are all urban problems because the Industrial Revolution needs people in cities, not on farms. All the stuff has to be close together to feed the factories. And we could afford to bring in all these immigrants in an industrial era economy because somebody could walk off a boat, not speak a word of English. You put them on an assembly line, you tell the guy, you turn the wrench a quarter way that way, and you do your job, you're done. Fantastic. They get a paycheck, they're home. Everything's great. But the government became much like the industrial era. And if you think about industrial era America, it's very centralized, very vertical, very expensive, it's unionized, it's fossilized, it's big, expensive, fat, stupid, and slow. Just like our government, right? And if you think about it, I grew up in the industrial age. Most of you did too. It's hard to explain to kids today, but when I was a kid, we had we didn't have 400 channels of television. We had three channels of television. We had ABC, CBS, and NBC. And the only reason anybody ever watched t because there's nothing else on on Sunday night at 7 o'clock. If you wanted to buy a car, you didn't have a choice of 30 cars. You could buy three cars. You could buy a Ford, a Chevy, or a Chrysler. That was it. We had one telephone company. So everything's very vertical, everything's very centralized, everything's very concentrated, it's very expensive, very unionized. You would start at a company like IBM, you'd come in the mailroom, you'd work through the sales department, work your way up to a junior vice presidentship, then you'd be vice president. At 65, you would retire and get your gold watch and your lifelong benefits, which would last until you turned 69 when your heart attack came, and you're done, you're off the map. And that's what the world was like. But 7,000 years ago, agriculture, 300 years ago, industry, and about 40 or 50 years ago, the third big thing that ever happened to humanity happened, and that's the information age. And the information age is 
here and not here, every day that goes by our country becomes a little bit less of an industrial era economy and a little bit more of an information age economy. But remember, we started with an agricultural economy, became an industrial economy, the government changed to match the economy. And this is the most in-demand product in the world. This is an iPhone 5. It's the most in-demand product in the world. Using this little piece of metal in my hand right now, right at the second, I can make a phone call and I can order steel from China, give them my credit card number, and it will appear at my door. And if you think that these bureaucrats and these pointy-headed deep thinkers in a, in a room in Washington, D.C. can control 300 million Americans, each one of which can do that on a moment's notice at any time and any place, you're out of your minds. There is no way that the federal government is that can't possibly move that fast. They're too big, they're too fat, they're too stupid, they're too slow, they're too fossilized, they're too expensive, they're too unionized. They can't keep up with this. This is democracy. This is people in action. This is little d Democrats, little d democracy. This is people moving locally in real time very, very quickly. These are business relationships that come and go before the federal government even is aware they're there. And because this is changing the economy, the government is going to change. It doesn't matter if Mitt Romney had won or Barack Obama had won. It's going to change and it's going to look a lot more like what we want it to look like. A lot more local, a lot more democratic, a lot less centralized, and much, 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 much cheaper for reasons that I'm about to show you. So I think, I think that when Barack Obama won his re-election, I, I, I was struck by this a couple days after. It, wasn't, it took me a couple days, that's how long it took me to stop crying and come out of the room. <laughs> I actually think that Barack Obama on his second inaugural speech is kind of like T-Rex. He actually reminds me of T-Rex, you know, he's got, he's got these big teeth, he's got these little kind of spindly arms, and, and his name means Tyrant King, and, and, and I, I kind of envision him as like standing on, the, on, on, the, on this ancient landscape, he's like, oh, I'm the king, and what he doesn't realize is, in the, in the sky behind him, there's a little light starting to grow, and it's the light of that incoming meteor that is going to wipe out all of the big, stupid things and leave only the tiny, small, quick, fast little things, the little mammals. That's the only thing that's going to be left. They're just going to get wiped away economically. You can't change it. You can't stop it. It's here. It happens every day. So the question we have, the challenge we have as conservatives is, how do we get in front of these ideas instead of behind them? It's really, the true question is, how do we prevent these damn Democrats from stealing this awesome conservative stuff the way they stole liberating black people from us? The Republican Party was designed to free the slaves, and they have managed to somehow make us into the oppressors of black people. So how do we stop this from happening again? Well, it's actually pretty simple, I think. We have to change the message. We have to change the way the message is presented. But me, me, I cannot be clear enough about this. I am not saying we have to change the philosophy. On the contrary, this Coca-Cola philosophy of conservatism is the best political philosophy there is. And when we run it, we win every single time. So I'm not talking about getting us less conservative. I'm talking about taking this perfectly pure, wonderful message of conservatism and putting it in the kind of box that people want to actually open. That's what I want to do. That's going to take a little bit of rebranding. So how can we rebrand people? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. <laughs> I have here my pocket constitution, never go anywhere without it. And um, here's a picture of George Washington on the front. Now, if you go to young people today and you talk about things like the Tea Party, I go to a lot of Tea Party events, and a lot of times at Tea Party events you'll see people dressed up like the Founding Fathers, and I think it's wonderful. I really do. I think it's wonderful because I know what it means. I see guys in the powdered wigs and the tri-corner hats and the muskets and the waistcoats and the, and the, the knee breeches and stuff, and I think that's fantastic. It reminds me of our Founders. And I see them standing in front of a Gadsden flag in the sense of rebelliousness, but frankly, young people today don't see that at all. They just see a bunch of nutty old people dressed up in wigs, wearing funny hats, carrying old, abandoned, rusty sticks in front of a flag with a snake on it. And you're asking them to follow you, and they say, are you out of your mind? <laughs> Look, it's a crime that they don't know what it means, but the fact of the matter, the cards that were dealt is, they don't know what it means. So we have to start thinking about changing the message. And a simple way to do it is just like this. 
Here's George Washington. We all know what George Washington looks like. If you ask a 20-year-old or a 19-year-old, what do you think about George Washington? He's an old guy with a white wig wearing a funny hat and he's wearing a funny shirt. True enough. But sometime, I don't know, it was during the war. It might have actually been during the war. It was a long war. George Washington sent a letter to a tailor in London, of all places. And the letter simply said, I would like to order four waistcoats of the most fashionable design and in the most pleasing colors currently accepted in high society. I'd like the buttons to be as ornamental as they can be without appearing ostentatious. And he wrote him a big check. What that really means is, is that George Washington was the best dressed man in the world. So if George Washington were standing here today, he wouldn't be dressed like this. George Washington, the essence of what George Washington is. George Washington here right now is six foot six. He's wearing a $20,000 Armani shoe. He's wearing $2,000 shoes. He has an $800 haircut. He's got an AR-15 with a laser target designator on it because he is a deadly, hip, swinging dude. And he was the most stylishly dressed man in the world to the people who looked at him. You need to think of George Washington in a $20,000 suit with $2,000 shoes, an $800 haircut, and an AR-15 because that's who he was. That's who he was. And you say that to young people, they start to think maybe there's something to this. Maybe there's something to this after all. People say to me, what's the tea party? Look, I've been to many tea party events. Thank God for the tea party, and thank God that the tea party is not centralized, that every single tea party its own group. That's the thing I like best about it. But if it were up to me, I would rebrand the tea party completely. I'd rename it, I'd get rid of all of that stuff. The first thing I would get rid of, by the way, if I had the power to do it, the very first thing I would get rid of is, I'd get rid of that GOP logo. Everybody know that elephant that we're talking about? Let me tell you something. If I was a graphic designer for Barack Obama, I could not come up with a better design for Republicans if I was on the other team. It's everything they want other people to think that we are. Stodgy, blocky, stupid, childish, slow. There's no eyes, there's no vision. It's got this little vestigial trunk. It looks like it belongs over a special needs arts class for second graders. It is appalling, it's awful. If it were up to me to design the new Republican logo, I would go out there and I would carve into the wall. I would carve into the wall with a, with a, with a knife, an, an R. It'd just be an R, it'd be straight lines and it'd be red like this, look like it was scratched into something. And people say, who put that there? So I don't know, he's gone. He's just gone. I don't know where it came from. I would change the name of the Tea Party and I would rebrand the Tea Party. I'd call it the Rebel Alliance. I'd call it the Rebel Alliance. And when people ask me, when young people come up to you and say, what is this, uh, this uh, Rebel Alliance thing that you guys claim to represent? What, what are you guys all about? I'd say, I'm not really allowed to tell you. <laughs> I really can't. I, I can't go into it to people who just come in off the streets who are uninitiated. <laughs> I can tell you this. We're horribly outnumbered. And we always have been, because good people have always been outnumbered by the bad people. We're horribly outnumbered. Horribly. And our, and our chances are very, very slim. And it's only through a lifetime of study and hard work that we understand these principles. It's only a lifetime of Jedi training that allows five or six of us to get into these beat up old X-wing fighters and go out there after wave, go through wave after wave after wave of incoming TIE fighters, breach the defenses of this giant Death Star that is going to eliminate this entire planet and turn all of you into dust and you don't even know it. And frankly, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> We're fighting for freedom. We are the Rebel Alliance. We are fighting evil in the cause of freedom. We're horribly outnumbered and our chances are very, very slim. You, you probably wouldn't want to be a part of it. And then I'd walk away and see what happens. It would have an effect on people. So, if we want to talk about messaging this way, let's talk about messaging this way. What is the message that the Democrats tell all the time through the pop culture? By the way, the message comes through the pop culture. It doesn't come through Barack Obama's speeches. Most people who vote for Barack Obama have never heard one of his speeches ever. They vote for Barack Obama because Lady Gaga says vote for Barack Obama, and George Clooney says vote for Barack Obama, and John Stewart says vote for Barack Obama. They don't listen to his speeches. They don't know what he represents. Everybody votes for him. 
The pop culture is how we put messages into people's heads. And we have different age groups in here, so I'm gonna ask each one, I'm gonna say three different things and I don't want anybody to leave me hanging here, you kids especially, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I don't want anybody to leave me hanging. So just so you know the kind of impact that the pop culture has on every single one of you, let's assume that I'm a political operative for Barack Obama, let's say, and let's say that I wanna start a finish, a sentence, and I know you so well, I put my message in your head so effectively that I'll start the sentence and you finish it. We'll do it three times for three different age groups. Right? Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. Okay. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. And here's one for you four guys right down there. It seems today that all you see Violence and movies and sex on TV. Okay, so the theme from Superman, the theme from Gilligan's Island, and the theme from Family Guy. Nobody went to any websites to figure out where those lyrics are. Nobody handed anybody a pamphlet that said, we'd like you to learn the lyrics of the Ballad of Jed Clampett or any of this other stuff. It went into your head because you have heard it thousands of times. And every single other message that went in there with that theme song went in there too. If you're an older person, when, when Hollywood was producing Coca-Cola, when you knew that it was up in the sky, look, it's a bird, a plane, it's Superman, messages about being America, being a good place went in with that. Gilligan's Island, more or less neutral. Family Guy, very, very, very anti-American. But they go in, and they stay in, and they don't get out. So what message do the Democrats and the progressives give us every single day? Well, they tell us three things. They tell us three things and three things only. The first thing that they tell us is, sharing is cool. Sharing is cool. Notice I didn't say that sharing is good. I said that sharing is cool. What's the antithesis of sharing is cool? Keeping your own stuff is really uncool. It's just not cool. It's not cool to have your own stuff. The second thing that they tell people is that wealth is unearned. That message appears all the time. Wealth is unearned. Why? Because this is actually a very moral generation, this young generation. Wealth is unearned is the key to the whole democratic progressive strategy because if wealth is actually earned, if you actually did make that money, then taking it from you is stealing. But if you took more than your fair share, then it's not only not stealing, it's justice, right? Wealth is unearned. And the third thing that they tell you again and again and again is very simple, and that's let us help you. Let us help you. You need health care? Fantastic. Let us help you. You need job relief? Let us help you. You got unemployment insurance? Let us help you. Let us help you. Let us help you. What's the matter with these Republicans and these conservatives who just want to help you? Why won't you let us help you? All we want is all of your money and all of your freedom. We'll help you all you want. <laughs> Those three things again and again and again are why America is becoming a collectivist country, why Barack Obama wins elections. So how do we stop it? We can't send out pamphlets and brochures and the videos I do and all this other stuff. It's nice, but it's really, we gotta get the message down to brass tacks. They tell us three things, we should tell them three things. I thought the three things were gonna be freedom, wealth creation, and virtue. But when I go to 16-year-olds and I say freedom, wealth creation, and virtue, they don't have a clue. So what we're gonna have to do if we're gonna win elections, and this is really the point of the whole evening here, is we're gonna have to learn how to speak the language of the pop culture and speak to people in a way that they understand. So why don't we just for a moment pull away all of the tri-corner hats and the flag bunting and let's pull away the Constitution and all this other stuff that I love as much as all of you and get all the stuff off to the side and take away liberal and Democrat and Republican and conservative and all that stuff and get it away. What we really wanna sell people are three things. Leave me alone, it's your stuff, and don't be a jerk. <laughs> okay, so let's walk through it. Freedom, if we wanna sell freedom to people, we can talk about a document that I revere more than anything on this earth, this document right here, but they don't get that. So, I'll go to a room in uh, a college, I've been to several liberal colleges, in fact, I've been to Oberlin College, which is the most liberal college in America. Oberlin is where, is where logic and reason go to die. <laughs> and, and I've spoken at Oberlin, and, and in order to turn these people into, these people are socialists, they're, they're, com they're committed socialists, committed Obama voters, and I've got a whole room full of them out there. And I'll say, put all these labels aside for a second. Let me ask you a question. It's not a trick question, and it's not a trap. Let me just ask you. Raise your hands out there if you're the kind of person who likes to be left alone. Raise your hand. And most of them do. And I'll say, now raise your hand if you're the kind of person that likes to tell other people what to do. 
Now, some people do really want to tell other people what to do. Some people really do, and you'll be escorted out, ma'am. There's security's waiting for you. <laughs> security's waiting in the back. Uh, the, get the black helicopters in here. But I'll tell you one thing about young people. There's not a 20-year-old college student, not one, that will raise their hand in a group of their other fellows and say, yes, I want to tell other people what to do. That's really an uncool thing, man. It's an uncool thing to tell other people what to do. So they won't do it. So you say, okay, you want to be left alone? Yeah, I do too. I want to be left alone too. Most of the time I want to be left alone. That means if I want to start a business, leave me alone. If I want to go into a lemonade stand, leave me alone. If I want to be skateboarding, leave me alone. We're the party that says leave us alone. We're the party that says let us do what we want to do. Let us keep what we make. We're the party that's, not, that, that's about being left alone. They're the guys that are trying to tell you that you can't have a big, big gulp. They're the guys that are telling you how warm your house has to be. They're the guys telling you what kind of car you want to drive. They're the guys telling you what kind of things you have to wear and what you have to do and who you have to be and who you have to hang out with. They're the guys who are telling you all this crap that is going to sit on your head. They're the guys with the helmet laws and the guys with all that stuff. We're the guys who say, leave us alone. Just don't be such a control freak, man. What is the matter? You know, the Democratic Party is made up of all those guys in, in, in junior high who wanted to be student council guys and they've got a plan for how they're going to restructure the parking lot and we're going to give free lemonade during the... You know, yeah, fantastic. Go. Leave me alone. I don't care. Go. Do your thing. God, go control somebody else. What's the matter with you? you? Genetic damage or something that has to tell people what to do. Leave us alone. That's freedom. You're a third of the way there. Now the second thing is wealth creation. Wealth creation is a little bit tougher thing to sell because of all the things that's been demonized by this pop culture, wealth is number one. But this is where you can really kick them where they live. And liberals, by the way, not progressives, live in a world of unearned moral superiority. So this one's just too much fun. 